Hi, this is Dick Wall from Escalate Software, and in this screencast we're going to look at a few of the remaining changes in Scala 2.8. We've already looked at the REPL, the Collections Library, default and named parameters, but there are still a few smaller but significant changes to take a look at. So the remaining topics to hit on are new annotations, uh, at tail rec and at specialized, Scala packages and how they work in Scala 2.8, continuations through a compiler plugin, and then a word on the changes to implicits and the new Packrat parser. Those are actually a little hard to demonstrate in any depth, but we can certainly cover what, what it means to you as a developer. So let's start with at tailrec. Let's bring up Scala. Okay, so recursive programming or recursive definitions are kind of a staple part of functional programming it's a way of getting uh, iterative or, or sort of iterative processes without having to have mutable state and a typical example of this is a factorial so if we go ahead and create a factorial function let's say we're going to have factorial n int it returns along because it's recursive we have to specify the return type and then we say this will be set to if n is less than one let's just return a one else return n times fact n minus one pretty standard definition of factorial so let's give this a try fact of five is that 120 fact of 10 is a much larger number, 3.6288 million. And fact of 20 is really pretty big, uh, a very large number. Okay, so this is, this is all good. Uh, the thing about recursion is that, you know, as methods or as functions get really highly recursive, you can end up putting a lot of, uh, or losing a lot of performance and putting a lot of strain on the stack. And eventually you can actually run out of stack space. Functional languages have a trick that they call tail recursion elimination. And what it's able to do is if the recursion call or the tail, or the call is in the tail position, as in the last thing that's called, it is able to turn it into a loop, and that means avoiding the problems with stack overflow and performance. Uh, so in this case, it looks like we have the call in the tail position here. So let's see what the compiler makes of it. The new feature in Scala 2.8 is a new annotation called at tail rec, and you can get it in scala.annotation.tailrec. There we go using the command line completion again. So now I've got that in, I can take that same definition that I just made, and I can put an at tail rec in front of it. And what this does is it tells the compiler, I expect this method to be tail recursive, and if it's not, instead of letting it through, I want a compile error. So what happens when I actually select this? Okay, uh, it actually tells me that this retains a recursive call not in the tail position. And although it looks like this is in the tail position, in fact, the last thing that gets executed in this function is a multiplication. What it does is calls the factorial of n-1 and then multiplies it by n times and returns it. So our logic here was flawed, and this is actually not a tail recursive method. Now, I can fix it up, though. Uh, this is a pretty standard way of fixing this by adding an accumulator which we will make along. And because we have default and named parameters, you can actually set it by default to be one. If it's not specified, it will be one. And then what we do here is we actually return either ack if n is mine is uh, less than one, or else we return factorial of n minus one comma n times ack. And that's how we fix this. Now, if I hit that, it actually accepts it, and I can still do fact 5, fact 10, and fact 20. So there you go. Now this is actually truly tail recursive. So this is a wonderful annotation to be able to ensure that what you think is tail recursive is the same as what the compiler does. And there's another trick that it has. Actually, you'll notice here the, the error method or error message is 
error could not optimize tail rec annotation method. It contains a recursive call not in the tail position. It tells you exactly what's going on. So let's take a look at this in an IDE. Here's my IntelliJ session, and I'm going to do the same thing that I just did in the command line there, or in the REPL. I'm going to say import scala.annotation.tailrec, and down here I'm going to put the tailrec on annotation on this. Save that, and then we're going to hit make. Okay, and we get the same error message. Tail rec annotation method, it contains a recursive call not in the tail position. So let's go ahead and fix that like we just did. Ack long equals one. And then this guy is actually defined as ack, and otherwise we do factorial of n, uh, and then n times ack. Okay. Hit compile on this guy. Okay, there is now an another error. And again, this is actually very descriptive. Uh, this is a, a really well-written annotation. It gives you a lot of information about what's wrong if it fails. So in this case, it says it is neither private nor final, so can be overridden. Now, because this is in a class, and as it says, this met or this fact, this function can actually be overwritten by something. It can't be optimized by the compiler because in order to make it into a loop, uh, you would lose the ability to override it further down. So in order for the compiler to actually make this work, we're going to go ahead and make this final and hit the return or oh, hit save here, compile it again. And this time you should see down here. Compilation completed successfully. So that is now working, and we can run this guy and see the output. And there you go. So that works. So that is the tail recursion elimination. Very nice uh, annotation in 2.8. Tail rec's pretty nice, but there is another interesting annotation in Scala 2.8 that's definitely. Uh, has some very important usages, and when you need it, you'll know about it. So let's take a look at something like uh, we've created a method called invoke reduce. Now, normally you wouldn't do this. You would just use a reduce operation or a fold left operation directly. But if you think about some of the situations where you might want to use this, perhaps you have a transaction against a database uh, that you want to set up, and you don't want to have to do all, all the work of opening up that transaction against the database every time you want to apply a particular function to the data in it. So what you would have is the you know, typical kind of loan pattern where you have all of the work done and you pass in a function that does your reduce for you. So everything except the function can be reused from time to time. So just giving a very simple example here, we've created or I've created a specialized demo with a method called invoke reduce that takes that will work on a particular type T, a particular generic type T. It takes, in this case, an array of T objects, and we have a function that takes a T and a T and returns a T. So that is effectively our reduce operation. And what we do here is we say for the array X, reduce left, and then we call the function with the two arguments, basically the first argument and the second argument that reduce left gives us. So that will do our reduce. It will fold all the numbers down together. To see what this looks like, take a look at the example here. So this is uh, an example. We create our specialized demo. And let's say in this case, we give it an array of integers and we give it a function that creates or that takes two integers and returns the result of adding them together. So dead easy. And as another example, we have an array of doubles. And what we uh, give the uh, method call is a function that takes the two doubles, returns the product of them. Okay, so let's have a look at what this looks like in execution. So go ahead and run it. It will make, take a few seconds, and then it will run it. Okay, and there we go. So the result of our first operation, adding all of the integers together, is 30, and the second one is 120.
Okay, so this is all very exciting. Now, one thing that is interesting to look at here is the results of the compilation. So this is the output directory. And you can see down here, our specialized demo has this a non-funk invoke on it. Uh, that's the, that's the result of the, of the function that we are using, uh, of that method. So what's the problem with this? Well, we are passing in two different types of primitive, uh, or two different primitive types. Uh, we've got, in this case, uh, an integer and an integer function, and here a double and a double function. In order for this function to work correctly, it actually has to do auto boxing, and that is pretty inefficient. So what we can do uh, now in Scala 2.8 is add a new import statement, Scala.specialized. We can mark this type as at specialized. Okay, now we save this and let's go ahead and run it again. So it's going to do our make again. Everything should work just the same as it did before. Give it a few seconds. And okay, so everything looks exactly the same. Now, what difference has this made? Uh, well, none to the execution, but if you take a look over here uh, in the back end in the compiled classes, suddenly there's a lot more anon funk invokes. And what you can see here is that in fact it's created an invoke for all these different types, all of the different primitive types. So there's a boolean, there's double, there's float, there's int, there's long, and so on. So this is a way of using generics for this kind of operation without paying the overhead of the performance of boxing and unboxing it. Uh, the, the price you do pay, however, is that you end up with a lot more, a lot more functions generated. And that can be significant, particularly when you start getting the kind of combina combinatorial explosion that happens if you have multiple at specialized types defined as generics. Uh, but anyway, this is a useful tool for performance tuning.